So my name is Dr. Jeff Jarvis. I am an EMS physician. I'm an emergency physician and a paramedic. Most importantly, let me get the paramedic part right. So uh, let's see. By the way, if you didn't get the patch, the airway uh, was it airway master. That is awesome. I love very cool patch. I'm a patch kind of guy. That's a great patch. So. We're gonna talk about airway, which is kind of fitting. What I wanna to talk to you all about, so to give you an idea, I mentioned um, I'm a EMS medical director. I practice in Central Texas. So have you all heard the phrase, keep Austin weird? Yeah, yeah, that's a big, yeah, keep, there's one of the weirdos right there. Well, our job in the surrounding counties is to keep the weirdness confined to Austin. So I work in Williamson County and Marble Falls, so suburban Austin. Um, so what I wanna to talk to y'all about is the research associated with how to manage airways in cardiac arrest. So this is a really big um, area of contention. When you have a lot, I mean, just tons and tons and tons of papers being done on the same topic, that means that we don't really understand what's going on. If it were an easy question, one paper, done, nobody else talks about it. But that is so not where we are right now. So big, big questions for how we're supposed to manage cardiac arrest. So let's take a look at some of those questions and then what, I think nothing in here likes me. I think, I think Microsoft computers can tell, they can smell an Apple guy. And they're like, you know what, I'm just gonna muck with you. Let's see what you think about this, buddy. So what, these are the questions that I wanna talk about. A whole bunch of questions, and if you've ever spent any time thinking about how to manage an airway in a cardiac arrest, these are probably the questions that you've come across. So what I wanna do is go through very rapidly and let you know what the research is, what the literature is that addresses all of these things. And if you're wondering what AAM is, um, that is advanced airway management. So if, uh, this is really nice, advanced airway management. What would you call that if you're using drugs? DAM, see, airway management, drug-assisted airway management. This is a DAM process. I can say this now, I wrote a paper on this, and we did. I wrote the entire paper just so I could say that. It is the DAM paper, awesome. But yes, otherwise known as RSI, I like my abbreviation so much better. So that's what AAM is. So why don't we get into this? Um, do we need advanced airway management at all? Um, I think this is a really good question, and we're going to take a look at this in two groups. The first is what is happening before we get there. You know, the part of the code that actually matters, like unfortunately more than what we do, what bystanders do. Does doing any type of ventilation matter? So what we were all taught, presumably, when we, very beginning of our career, is that we need to do mouth to mouth with our CPR or barrier to mouth, having done mouth to mouth, yuck. Um, so some type. Well, this was a study, great big study, um, using a Japanese registry. So if you die out of the hospital, in Japan, anywhere in Japan, the data from your cardiac arrest ends up in a registry. And that is wonderful because you can do really good research based on that. We can learn an awful lot of insights from doing that. And I would love to say that we have the same thing here in the United States. Unfortunately, we don't. What we have is CARES, the Cardiac Arrest Registry to Enhance Survival. It is not coast to coast. Um, it's not every cardiac arrest. It covers probably 45% of the population, maybe 50% of the population. Um, so if your agency is not reporting data to CARES, as a, as a researcher, as somebody who would like desperately to improve cardiac arrest care, please get your agency to report data. Really important stuff. And this is an example why. What they did with this Japanese registry is they took all patients with bystander CPR and they broke them up into groups based on the type of ventilations they were getting. Was this compression only, no ventilations at all, just get on the chest, deep, hard, fast, don't stop? Or was it conventional CPR? And they calculated the neurologically intact survival. So neurologically intact survival compression only 41% versus 33% with conventional. 
Now, they calculate something called an adjusted odds ratio. And I want to explain what odds ratios are because I'm going to be talking about them a lot through this presentation. An odds ratio is a really complicated formula. You all ready for this? Get a, get a pencil, paper, maybe a graphing calculator. That will help. It is the ratio of the odds. Ooh. So it would be, say, 40% divided by 33%. Boom, that's an odds ratio. An odds ratio, because if you divide one number by itself, the answer you're gonna get is one. 52.8 divided by 52.8 is one. So an odds ratio of one means there's no difference between the groups. An odds ratio greater than one means there is an increase in whatever you're measuring. So in this case, it would be an increase in functional neurologic survival. If that number is below one, now, with a ratio, you, you're just not going to get a negative number. So it's between 0 and 1. And if you're below 1, that means decreased odds of whatever the thing is. And then this number behind it in parentheses, that's the 95% confidence interval. A lot of stats behind that, but to put it in something most of us think about, when we're watching an election or reading about polls, they talk about a margin of error. There are statistic, uh, statisticians right now that are twitching that I'm using this analogy, but there are no statisticians in here, right? If you are, please just lie to me and make me feel better. Um, think about it as a margin of error. So if both sides of that range are above one, we have confidence that that's a real number. So if you are used to seeing p-values, p-values are kind of pointless. Um, this reporting of the uh, confidence interval is a much better way to do this. So bottom line here, 33% increased odds, functional neurologic survival with compression only. We don't need to muck with the airway when it comes to bystander CPR. Now, maybe there's something different about codes in Japan. Maybe the physiology is different with Japanese humans versus American humans. Kind of doubt it, but if you get the same answer in multiple data sets, you have a stronger conclusion. So let's take a look at this in Arizona. They did this massive campaign in Arizona where they looked at uh, bystanders, really focused on encouraging bystander CPR and doing it with compression only. And what they wanted to know is what was the difference in functional neurologic survival. So if they did compression only, 13% of people walked out of the hospital uh, playing the piano again. Conventional CPR, pump blow, pump blow, 8% versus 5% if there was no CPR at all. So basically what we're seeing here is the same thing that we saw in Japan. It turns out humans are humans after all. Now, the thing that is interesting, what they did is they found pretty close to the same answer, uh, an odds ratio, uh, and by the way, the AOR, that's adjusted. So if you have two groups and we're talking about survival from cardiac arrest, would y'all anticipate that the group that is in V-fib and arrest in front of a defibrillator will have a higher survival than someone in a systole that arrest at the bottom of the Grand Canyon? Yeah, so what they do, that matters. So they'll run through these regression analyses to adjust for those things. So that's what adjusted odds ratio is. So the interesting thing here is they found that 59% improved odds of survival, but they also compared conventional CPR to no CPR at all, and there was no difference. Wow. So we, are, we have all beat it into our population, hopefully, that doing bystander CPR is really, really important. Well, one of the reasons that people might not want to do bystander CPR is mouth-to-mouth -mouth is yucky. Yes, it is. So they don't want to do anything at all. So if we teach compression only CPR, the thought is, well, maybe more people will do bystander CPR. Well, that's true. It does happen. And it turns out that mucking with the airway does not improve survival at all compared to just not doing anything. So big win for compression only CPR here. But that's what happens before we get there. Let's talk about when we get there does the timing of what we do with the airway matter? So we're gonna go back to Arizona with this. They um, coined this term cardiocerebral resuscitation, and it was a new approach to uh, cardiac arrest resuscitation for them. And what they focused on, there were really five components of this. 
The first is delayed intubation. And what they mean by that is don't stick anything other than an oral pharyngeal in the airway until six minutes into the code. Intubating or using a superglottic is not the key thing here. They said what we should do instead is drop an oral pharyngeal airway in to open the airway and then put a non-rebreather mask on and turn it on, all the way on, going to whatever it goes to, all the way. So passive oxygenation only. Now the concept here, it's not like they're just squeezing the oxygen reservoir, which I've seen by the way, that was very entertaining, does no good. Um, what they're doing is just increasing the oxygen concentration in the oropharynx. And it turns out oxygen diffuses down a concentration gradient really well. We create an area of high concentration in the oropharynx. The lungs, because we're moving blood, because we're doing good compressions, we're moving blood and taking that oxygen out to the body. It turns out passive oxygenation all by itself can deliver a substantial amount of oxygen. Certainly enough, as this theory goes, to make it for six minutes. Now, the reason I think this is probably important, there are some important things going on early on in a cardiac arrest. CPR, getting that established is not all that easy, particularly getting it established in a pit crew fashion where you're replacing people, you have some sort of feedback device there, that takes time. Trying to get your IV access, trying to get your multifunction pads on, that takes time. And if you're also trying to muck around with the airway, that's a distraction. So, passive oxygenation. This is the concept. Then they do minimally interrupted compressions, really focus on the quality of compressions. As soon as they hit zap, no more rhythm checks. This is kind of standard of care now. This is hopefully what all of us are doing. Um, but this paper was published in 2008. This is one of the reasons that we don't do post shock rhythm analyses anymore. So get right back on the chest and then give epinephrine as early as possible. That was their bundle of care. That is what they call cardiocerebral resuscitation. So there is obviously a decreased emphasis on early advanced airway management. And what did they find? So overall survival. Now, it's important when you look at survival to not compare it to say what you see coming out of Seattle. What you see coming out of uh, Seattle is Utstein survival. This is only patients with witness arrest who are in VFib. Does that make sense? So that number is going to be much higher. This is everybody. This is septic granny in a nursing home and the professional athlete who drops right on top of an AED. So what they showed is a threefold increase in the odds of survival, 4.7 up to 17, and that odds ratio is 8.6. 8.6 is a huge odds ratio. That means a 760% increase in the odds of survival. So minimally interrupted chest compressions, delayed intubation, early epinephrine made a difference. So it looks like early on, we don't need to intubate our patients. Well, what about if you look in the hospital? So this was a large in-hospital registry, 688 hospitals that contributed data to this. And what they looked at was what are the odds of survival if we have early advanced airway management versus late advanced airway management. And what they found is if you did um, intubation at all, that lowered your odds of survival. Now, can anybody think of a potential problem with this study? Yes, sir. Correct. I'm just looking out here. I don't see any, except for you in the back, I don't see any candidates for intubation. Somebody didn't get enough coffee this morning, but <laughs> right, everybody's pointing to somebody. You're exactly right. This is a resuscitation bias, and it's a huge issue when you're looking at EMS research. So the patient that you walk up hits zap, and they go, ouch, thank you for coming. Do I really need to go to the hospital? You're not going to intubate them. So they tried to adjust for this with a thing called the time-dependent propensity analysis. You can never adjust that out completely. But this does seem to be seeing the same thing. So bottom line here, I think um, very, very early airway management, probably bad. And not doing anything with the airway, the entire code, also probably bad. Well, all right, so we're not going to go immediately in and intubate. Yes, sir? Yeah.
Yeah. So the question is if you have, they looked at a six minute delay before intubation, what about the response time? So they measured that from time on scene. So that was part of their resuscitation. I will tell you in my system, we did this initially and then we have scaled it way back. The only time we're doing it is if they arrest in front of us, which also is nice because if they arrest in front of us, it's gonna take us a little bit of time to get ready. Um, so that was, again, that was 2008. Um, the concept I think is still good, but we probably should be bagging them in the meantime, particularly if they've been down for a while. All right, so let's take a look now at what to do once we're going to start doing something. So we basically have three options, right? In the doing something category, we have mask ventilation, we have intubation, and we have some flavor of supraglottic airway. So supraglottic airways or extraglottic airways, blind insertion devices, whatever you wanna call them. I'm being overly generous, lumping all things that go into the airway that are not in the trachea as a supraglottic. So we can quibble about whether a King LT is a supraglottic or I don't care. I'm gonna lump it all in there. And the research does the same thing. So this was a study that went back to that Arizona trial. And remember what they did was ask people to do something that is very, very novel just put a non-rebreather on. How many of y'all are doing or have heard of this passive oxygenation concept? All right, how many of y'all have not and are thinking you are smoking crack? Well, good. Well, when they first rolled this out, there were a lot of people thinking, you're doing some crack there, Dr. Bobro. There is no way we're gonna do this. So there was some resistance to the medics. The medics were like, no, I'm just not gonna do it. So some people had that and some people didn't during this trial and they went in and they compared within that trial. They said, let's take a look at the people who actually got what we asked them to do, non-rebreather oral pharyngeal versus BVM. The majority actually got BVM. There's a lot of uncomfortableness about this. So what we see is that if you follow the protocol, if you did the non-rebreather with the OPA, with the passive oxygenation, 38% functional neurologic survival versus 26% with a BVM only. That's an odds ratio of 2.5. So it really does seem to work here. So that's good. Maybe we don't need to go directly in. Now, there is and I have like entire lectures about epinephrine. There's nothing I like more than kicking the heart association about epinephrine. I'm not gonna do that here. Y'all can be happy about that, but I will tell you there is a lot of debate, shall we say, about the best way to use epinephrine. There really isn't any debate that epinephrine improves ROSC, it improves short-term outcomes, and if you're going to use it, you should use it early. So that is pretty consistent. So the question then with airway management is if you're mucking around with the airway, does that delay administration of epinephrine? And we've determined that delaying epinephrine is bad. Well, one of the ways that we have tried, you're never gonna get a randomized control trial where they say give early epi versus late. There's enough evidence to say we probably ought not to be doing that. So they did a secondary analysis of a paper called PART. We're gonna talk about PART a lot more here, but basically this was a randomized control trial looking at endotracheal intubation versus King LT. And they did a secondary analysis and they basically said, all right, of everybody who got an uh, advanced airway, what was the impact of time to epinephrine? Well, bottom line, no difference. So the people, statistically no difference. So the folks that got a King LT, they got their epi in 8.6 minutes, i.e. nine minutes. Those who got intubation got their epinephrine in nine minutes, no statistical difference. So the type of airway management that you use, once you get around to doing some advanced stuff, does not make a difference. They did, however, say, well, let's take a look at the group that got early epinephrine, meaning under 10 minutes, and the group that got late epinephrine, and sure enough, there was a difference in survival. Early epinephrine matters. All right, so the type of airway you use, though, does not impact epi. Well, how about BVM only? What is the evidence that says just use a BVM? There is a lot of, there are a lot of people who advocate just using BVM only, and they have some literature um, to point to. 
Well, let's take a look at some of that literature. Let's go back to the Japanese registry. 650,000 adult cardiac arrest. Most of these patients, the Japanese system is different than ours. Most of these patients had BVM only, no intubation at all. Well, they grouped them into chunks. How about those who got BVM only? How about those who got something in their airway? What was survival? Well, it was double. Um, the survival with BVM only, 2.9% versus 1.1% if we muck around with the airway. That gives you an adjusted odds ratio comparing advanced airway to no advanced airway of 0.38. Now, what 0.38 means is that is a, oh God, I gotta do math, 62% decrease in the odds of survival if you muck around with the airway. Now, sir, you mentioned resuscitation glass. That's a big issue. Remember, this was not a randomized control trial. This is a registry. We just look at how things happened and we put them into chunks. There is perhaps a reason that people got BVM only. So maybe the BVM group had a predominance of young people with VFib with a witness arrest who got shot. They try to adjust for these things, but again, it's hard to adjust all of them. But this is some evidence that BVM only is better. Well, let's take a look at this in a different way. Going back to part, we're gonna slice and dice part again in another secondary analysis, and we're gonna compare BVM only and BVM as a rescue to failed airway, which is when we get to part, there was an awful lot of failure going on, versus a successful airway. And what they found is BVM only had a higher rate of survival, exactly what we expect. BVM as a rescue really had a higher rate of survival. Now, I will tell you, this is the only place I've ever seen this looked at, BVM as a rescue from failed airway, and I have absolutely no idea what to make of this. It just makes no sense to me. But this is the thing with science. The results don't have to make sense to us. Our job is to look at this and then do additional studies to try to understand it. This is one I don't understand. All right, what we need here is an RCT. We need a randomized control trial that says all cardiac arrest, we're gonna lump you into BVM only. Over here, you're gonna get intubated. So the French did this, and remember the SAMU model of EMS in France is different than ours. They put physicians on their ambulances, typically anesthesiologists. Um, any anesthesiologist in here? Good, I can make smart ass comments. So <clears throat> those, um, so physician run EMS, actually don't have any, I just wanna be sure. Those are physician run um, systems and typically the physicians that are do the intubation. So this was a randomized trial BVM, where, and they also run nurses or EMTs, they do the mask ventilation because it's an easier skill, right? Versus the physician doing the intubation. I will tell you that probably the intubation is the easier of those two things. Um, and then what they looked at is functional neurologic survival. Most of these patients are in a systole. It's just, it's the same as our population. There was one bit of a, a challenge here. Um, this was a non-inferiority study. So that's challenging. So let me tell you a little bit about a non-inferiority study. First off, I think this is a stupid study design. Um, it, if I have to write a graph like this to explain the study design, it's confusing. I have to put this in every talk I give about non-inferiority designs because I don't understand them. I need my cheat sheet to make sure I get it. So the basic concept of a non inferiority why would you study something if you want, don't know, want to know whether it's better or not. Well, let's say there are two drugs to treat AFib RVR, for example. One of them costs all of the money and the other is very affordable. Now, the advertising for the one that's expensive, boy, that's pretty. I mean, the sales reps, whoo, they're great. The one that is dirt cheap, nobody cares about, except the folks who have to pay for our service. Um, now, if they work equally well, I'm okay with the cheap one not being any better than the really expensive one, as long as it's not worse. Does that make sense? That's the basic concept of a non-inferiority trial. What we have here is something called a forest plot. And what you see, that line down the middle, the solid line down the middle says no difference. So if your confidence interval for your results crosses no difference, 
that means there's no difference. The number could be higher, could be lower, we don't know, so there's no difference. If your number is crossing that line, but it is above this point that you define as non-inferior. So we say cheap drug will be non-inferior if it's no worse than, say, 2% different from expensive drug. Does that make sense? So that's the, the concept. I won't belabor that. Um, let's take a look at what they found. ROSC, 34% BVM only versus 39% with intubation. Hey, look at this. Intubation's looking better. But, and they're measuring a difference here, not an odds ratio, so if it crosses zero, there's no difference. No difference. Functional neurologic survival. CPC is a cerebral performance category. It's a way of measuring good outcome. CPC one or two means you can pay taxes again. That's a good thing, that's what we care about. 4.3 with BVM versus 4.2 intubation. No difference. They said, was this a difficult airway to manage? either with BVM or with intubation. Oh, definite difference. The mask ventilation was harder to manage, which kind of reflects what I think most of us who have done this for a while, and definitely all of us who have watched other people do this, that would uh, kind of matches my experience. How about failure to manage the airway? Only 2% of intubations failed, 7% of mask ventilation is failed. And what they mean by failure, you can't ventilate with the mask, so then you default to intubation. Or you can't intubate, so you default to mask ventilation. Um, they also took a look at regurgitation, almost twice as high with mask ventilation than intubation. And they said, well, does doing this interrupt compressions more? And it turns out mask ventilation actually interrupted compressions more. All right, so what does that end up with on this non-inferiority um, design? Well, it turns out that if you end up with a graph like that, you can't say this, you can't say it's better, you can't say it's no different. All you can say is we failed to show non-inferiority. So when you do a non-inferiority study, it's a bit of a gamble. You're rolling dice and they came up empty, which is why this is a stupid study design. But the bottom line, I do think we can get some information here which is probably not a huge difference between mask ventilation entirely until you get pulses uh, versus intubation. All right, again, I can uh, diss on this, this uh, methodology for a while, but really think it sucks. Um, one thing we did notice, and I think most of us have seen, is when you're mask ventilating, particularly when you're not doing it well, you get gastric insufflation and they have a tendency to make your uniforms dirty. We don't like that. Well, does that regurgitation matter. This is what we care about. Well, I care about my uniform, but, and it's just yucky, but I want to know, is the patient going to suffer? And the main ways patients suffer is aspiration. The reason we care about aspiration is it causes pneumonia. Now, it takes a while to develop pneumonia. You aspirate, you're like, mm, that stuff definitely went into the lungs. They don't develop pneumonia immediately. Pneumonia is a reactive process, so it takes a little bit. So they said, we're going to measure those folks who survived at least 12 hours, and then we're going to look at, did the people who got intubated get more pneumonia versus those who had mask ventilation? No difference. So it turns out, even though there was a lot more regurgitation, it didn't make a difference to the patient. Definitely didn't see that coming. All right, so that's mask ventilation versus intubation. Now the question we want to address is what about intubation versus a superglottic airway? So I'm going to take a look at all of the non, or quite a few of the non-randomized control trials. Then we'll talk about the randomized control trials where we really get the answer. So just for history, let's take a look at Rock Primed. Rock Primed was a massive multi-center US study and they actually were conducting two studies at the same time. So they would randomize patients to early versus late rhythm analysis, which basically means you do 30 to 60 seconds of CPR before analyzing the rhythm. That's the early. And then the late is three minutes, so 180 seconds. That study showed no difference in overall survival. Early, late, doesn't matter. They also looked at an ITD. An ITD is the little thing you put on the end of the ET tube or the BVM, and what this looks like, it has a little metronome and it changes airway pressures. Boy, do we like marketing that. 
that thing looks sexy. Does it make a difference? Randomized control trial? No, it does not make a difference. And it was kind of cool. They actually came up with a little sham device so the people using it weren't supposed to be able to tell which group it was. All right, so that was one study with two arms in it. We put all of that data in and said, well, some of these patients, just because of the way their systems work, got intubation, they intubate first. Other systems would use a King LT first. What does the difference look like? Well, first off, over 80% of these EMS systems were intubating. So most of the patients were intubated. They looked at the difference in functional neurologic survival and they got 5% versus 4%. So higher survival with intubation. As a proponent of intubation, I look at that and go, me likey. Okay, well, <clears throat> what about complications? It turns out there were no complications. So this trial suggests intubation is the way to go. Now, this is, I mentioned the CARES registry earlier. This is our version of that Japanese registry. Part of that data says, did you intubate or did you not? So they went in and said, let's look at all these cardiac arrests and we will group people into no advanced airway at all, meaning bag mask, versus intubation versus superglottic. And what did they find? Higher survival with intubation versus superglottic. How much higher? 44% increased odds of functional neurologic survival with intubation. Me definitely like you that. Now what about no airway? So BVM only, way higher survival. So the takeaway from this is that mask ventilation only, way better than any advanced airway, but if you're gonna do an advanced airway, intubation is better than mask ventilation. This is absolutely subject to that resuscitation bias that we talk about. All right, how about doing, oh, I don't know, look at all of the literature that's out there. This was done in 2014. So all of the literature that had compared intubation to superglottics that was published by 2014, they lumped all of those in. They found 10 different papers, a total, these are a lot of cardiac arrest. 34,000 arrests who got intubated versus 41,000 who got a superglottic. And they wanted to know what is better survival. And they found 33% higher odds of functional neurologic survival with intubation than superglottic. I'm liking this. This is looking pretty good. This is looking, looking like intubation works. Um, I really like this, but all of these really are either um, observational trials, meaning not randomized control trials, or they're really small randomized control trials with problems. We need big, well done randomized control trials. Along comes 2018. We had two studies that were published, um, actually, I'm trying to think, I think they may have been published in the same edition of JAMA. For nerds like me, that's like, oh, this is so awesome. All of the research. So Airways 2, let's start with Airways 2. This was a British study, only four ambulance services. Their ambulance services are a little bigger than our ambulance services. They're regional. So those four itty bitty services cover something like 80% of the British population, massive place. They did something really interesting in the way they randomized this trial. So what we wanna do is we want some patients randomly to get intubation, others to get superglottic. But the way we set this up matters. So they randomized by paramedic. Oh, I love this methodology. So <clears throat> if we were gonna do this here, I would say, okay, everybody who's interested in participating in this trial, raise your hand. And let's just say everybody raises their hand. Okay, great. We are going to randomly assign each and every one of you into an intubation group or a superglottic. And what that means is for the duration of this trial, every cardiac arrest you run, your initial attempt in an airway will be the group that you're assigned to. I love this. Why do I love this? I focus on teaching intubation a lot. And what I found is it's hard. It really is. And practice is incredibly important. I have beautiful control charts that look at our system's first pass success rate as we're doing training every week. Train, 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 train. For some reason we stop, I don't know, like a virus or a global pandemic, something like that. We stop training and our first pass success drops and it drops fast. 
you have to constantly train on this. Superglottics, it turns out, you don't have to constantly train on. It's an easier technique. <clears throat> Our first pass success rate with superglottics did not change at all. So if you, um, the other way to randomize this <clears throat> is to randomize it by patient. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So half of the patients you run, you'll intubate, half you'll use the superglottic on. What that means is that your at-bats, if you will, with intubation drops. I think experience is important, so that's the reason I love this strategy. So they looked only at arrest um, in adults, non-traumatic, um, and they wanted to know intubation, and this is almost exclusively DL. I think there may have been like one paramedic um, over there using some flavor of video laryngoscopy early on. And then they used an eye gel. If they failed with that device, they could randomize and switch over to somewhere outside of their trial. And they're looking at functional neurologic survival. That's what we care about, not so much with Ross. All right, what did they find? Well, big numbers. So we're talking 4,800 people uh, got intubated, 4,400 got an eye gel. We were way more successful with the eye gel than intubation. Now, they did not report first pass success, which really irritated me because I want to compare this to the trial we're going to talk about next part. Um, if you dig deep, 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 I mean way deep, um, into the appendices that are online only, you'll find that the first pass success here was pretty similar to what it was in part. In other words, it sucked. <clears throat> first pass success with the eye gel, though, was much better. Um, so clearly, first pass success or overall success, much higher with an eye gel than intubation. There was more regurgitation a trend toward more regurgitation, but that was not a significant difference. Same thing with aspiration, not a significant difference. There was a significant difference in the loss of an airway. So you have the airway controlled, and then something happens, and you lose your airway more often with an eye gel than with intubation. And that probably has to do with the cuff in the ET tube, um, and that sort of matches what I would think too. All right, so that, that's the baseline population. What did we find? ROSC, did you have pulses at the emergency department? More people had pulses with the eye gel than intubation. Okay, ROSC, maybe a little bit of difference. How about functional survival? Um, the ITT is intention to treat, by the way, that's the way they analyze the data, no difference. No difference in survival in a really well done randomized control trial, intubation versus um, an eye gel with the caveat that first pass success sucked. All right, so maybe we're not very good at it. Now, they did do something though and said, well, let's take a look at only those patients who had a successful airway placed. Remember that resuscitation bias thing? <clears throat> the people you go up to zap and they wake up and don't get any airway? Well, there were some of those in this paper. The catch is they were evenly randomized in both groups. That's the power of a randomized controlled trial. And when you measured it, it turns out they were equally represented in both groups. So that part, the resuscitation bias, didn't really play into this study. But they did say if we take a look at only those people with a successful placement. So there were some you just couldn't intubate or put an eye gel in. And there was a small improvement in survival with the eye gel group. Does that make sense? All right, bottom line here, no difference in functional neurologic survival. Um, ET is hard, uh, definitely harder than an eye gel. There was more aspiration, um, and there was definitely more tube loss. All right, one, that's 50% of the best airway trials out there. Um, so that's what we know. Part. Part is the pragmatic airway um, resuscitation trial. Pragmatic means we're not gonna sh give you any additional training in this study because we want it to be, well, there are two reasons. One, the sunny side, the, the optimistic side, is we want this to be as reflective of actual practice as possible. I get that. What's the real reason? They ain't got the money. A pragmatic trial is easier to run. Uh, you don't have to pay for all that pesky extra training. Now, the reason that Matt, and that's pragmatic, by the way, the reason they did this, this was an NIH funded grant. Dr. Wang who's a friend of mine, um, ran it, really well done trial. Um, 
the NIH just doesn't want to fund anything other than pragmatic trials. And you kind of got to do what the dude writing the check says. So that's where they end up. <clears throat> Their randomization, though, was by device. So this is a little different than Airways 2. What they did is they said, okay, congratulations, your system is going to participate. Um, what we will do is your system is going to intubate as your initial attempt for the next three months. After that, for the three months after that, you're going to use a King LT. So everybody was going back and forth. And I think that means, and remember, no additional training. I think what that's telling us is that there is less skill in this. So you're losing something. Um, unlike the British trial, which used IGEL, they used King LT. And they also did not look primarily at functional neurologic survival. They looked at 72 hour survival. Why? Well, because it's cheaper to do that. Now, it turns out they did report on functional neurologic survival, no difference than 72 hour survival. So, <clears throat> Speaking of aspiration, what did the groups look like? Well, the group in the King LT group had a higher proportion of rapid responses. So the response time under four minutes. So 28% in the King LT group had a response time under four minutes versus only 22 in the intubation group. First off, props to them for getting 28% to 28% of your cardiac arrest in under four minutes. Think about that. How hard it is to get to a cardiac arrest in under four freaking minutes. Um, they must have just been right on top of them. Definitely a difference. Now, in cardiac arrest, y'all may have heard me bitch and moan about response times as performance indicators and saying response times don't matter. Yeah, except in cardiac arrest. <laughs> and they very much matter in cardiac arrest. So if the only thing I told you about two groups is group A got had shorter response times in cardiac arrest than group B, who do you think would have the higher survival? Group A. You got there faster. So keep that in mind. First pass success, way better with the King LT. 90% versus 52% intubation. Boy. I think if our design was to suck at intubation, man, did we nail it. What I will tell you is that this is lower than all of the observational trials. When we look at large data sets, NIMSIS or the ESO data set, what we see is first pass success rates in the low 70s. Um, this is definitely lower than where we are. We don't know why. My take is because you kept going back and forth between intubation and, and King LT. All right, so failure, you can see what that is. Unrecognized displacement, more unrecognized displacement with intubation than with the King LT. And airway swelling, this really sur uh, surprised me. And the reason I say it surprised me is before I took over my EMS system as medical director, I was an ER doc in that system. And at that time they would transport pretty much all cardiac arrest and they would use a King LT on all cardiac arrest. So I found myself pulling a King LT and placing an into, uh, ET tube. Why, you might ask, was I removing a perfectly functional King LT and intubating? Pure freaking hubris. I mean, there is no good evidence that says I should do that. I should just leave it alone. Uh, but no, no, I'm the arrogant ER doctor. I got to take it out. And what I will tell you is that every, the re resistance is hard. Boy, it's tough doing that. When I would pull the LT, the airway was a macerated mess. It was just a complete disaster. So my result from that was that I declared jihad on the King LT. Now, it turns out every airway that I was seeing that was so um, torn up is probably because we were using it wrong. Because when you look in this trial, where presumably they knew how to use it, there was no difference in airway swelling. So I hate to admit it, but this is probably an, an issue of we weren't using it right. So for the poor folks with Ambu who have been getting really tired of me beating up the King LT, yeah, you're right. It's probably because we were misusing it. What was the bottom line? What was the difference in survival? There was a 2.9% increased survival when using a King LT versus intubation. Okay, I definitely don't like this result. I 
I think we should be intubating, and I see this result, and I'm like, huh. And this is a well-done trial. So I spent an awful lot of time reading this paper, trying to tear it up, trying to find reasons that my bias is correct. And I'm having a hard time with it. Um, I really do think that this is probably right. I think this is accurate. Now, uh, there are some caveats to this. Uh, the biggest is that if you do any adjusting, this difference goes away. So if you adjust for that response time that we talked about, it goes away. Um, there is the King LT, you got it in faster, and this is one of the arguments. The only problem with that argument is it turns out getting an airway in faster doesn't make any difference. I think we already looked at that. Um, there is also the argument about why King LT was faster. The Milwaukee Fire Department is why King LT was faster. So Milwaukee had contributed the largest number of patients to this study. King LT was a device placed by their first in engines. Intubation was on their ambulances, so of course it's going to be faster. So we can't necessarily say that just putting a King LT in um, is easier and faster. Now other papers tell us it's easier and faster, but huge bias there. And for some strange reason, a full third of patients who are intubated had the ET tube removed and replaced in the ER. The only thing I can come up with there is ER doctor hubris. I mean, I, we just like intubating, so we felt the need to replace it. Yes, sir. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's go back and take a look at how low, shall we? 51.6%. No. So the question is, since we suck so bad at intubation, and these were all DL, the, again, in the U.S. study, like one dude with a VL, almost exclusively uh, DL. Has there been a randomized control trial of superglottics versus video? No, there has not, and there probably won't be, uh, which is a bit unfortunate. The reason I say there probably won't be is these are expensive trials to run. Henry's budget on this uh, trial was just under $2 million. Uh, the NIH doesn't give $2 million grants out all that often. Um, so they're really hard to run. I doubt we're gonna see that again. So it's, it's deeply upsetting to me um, that we won't because that is a huge question. Um, we do have ways of getting at that question. <clears throat> and first off, the way to look at it is, well, does first pass success matter at all in cardiac arrest? Because if it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter whether VL gets you a higher first pass success, right? Does that make sense? Well, let's take a look at that because there is some literature on that. <clears throat> way too much coffee. So the bottom line here, this trial, unlike Airways 2, showed that superglottics have a higher success. So Airways 2, no difference, part, difference, superglottic, better. <clears throat> and we sucked. <clears throat> what we need here is a network meta-analysis. Do you know why we need a network meta-analysis? Because academics got to academic. We got to do this paper. Um, I'm a little biased by this because I was a peer reviewer on this paper. And in case you're wondering what is a network meta-analysis, that was exactly the question that I had as I got assigned this paper to review. Um, thank God for Wikipedia. <clears throat> a network meta-analysis is where you take multiple trials. So say a trial comparing BVM to intubation and then a trial of superglottics to um, intubation, but they never compared BVM to superglottics. Well, that's what a network meta-analysis does, puts all these things together. <clears throat> and what did they find? Um, really, no difference. Comparing all of them, roughly equivalent. All right, let's take a look at part and try to figure out what the difference is. I hate bagpipes. I just wanna say, <clears throat> I absolutely hate bagpipes. How many of y'all have been to a line of duty funeral, a line of duty death with a funeral? What do they always have? Bagpipes. I can't listen to bagpipes without crying. So I wish they would just go away. 
what can explain this difference? So is it first pass success? Is it compression and eruption? Is it hyperventilation? Well, let's take a look. So the CAM trial, this was that French study, BVM versus intubation. What did they find? They found that um, actually BVM early on, um, there was, I'm sorry, early on there was more interruptions with intubation than BVM, and then later more interruptions with BVM overall really didn't matter. That's probably not it. How about in rocked primed? What did we find? Were there more compression interruptions with intubation versus supraglottic? Yes, yes, there were. Um, except it was the other way around. So um, there were some more interruptions. How about with part looking at King LT versus intubation? And what we're going to do here is instead of measuring um, the number, we're just going to look at compression fraction. No difference in the interruptions. Fascinating. What about first pass? So I really wanted to know this, and I spent way more time bugging Henry about this than I should have. So he said, fine, hop on a paper. We're going we're gonna to try and take a look at this. This looked, used some advanced statistics to try to say how much of that 2.9 difference is attributable to first pass success. And what they did is dropped um, first pass success in as a variable in their logistic regression. Very fancy statistics. And what they found is you get improved ROSC with first pass success, but no difference in 72 hour survival, no difference in functional survival. Now, my problem is, and I'm an author on this paper, so I have to blame myself, but my problem with this is sometimes you can, you can get too clever with your stats. And I think we got too clever with the stats here. Let's take a look at this in different ways. What about first pass success in hospital? Um, the South Koreans also have a registry. They looked at this, and what they found is yes, first pass success matters. You had lower first uh, lower ROSC if you didn't have success on the first attempt. And basically, they said um, a failed attempt is associated with at least a three minute delay in ROSC. The longer you're in cardiac arrest, the worse off you are. So it certainly seems to. Well. One question is, well, could we do something with DL to improve first pass success? Um, took a look at bougie use, and what we found is that it improved first pass success, and it improved overall success, but there was no difference in survival. So that doesn't seem to be it. What about video laryngoscopy? Now, this was another um, paper we did. And I think all of these are Henry's way of getting me to shut up about first pass success. Um, it's not gonna work. I still think it's important. This study looked at the ESO data collaborative. So tons and tons and tons of patients, 22,000 cardiac arrests that were intubated. Majority, 75% were with DL, only 25% were with VL. And what did we see? First pass success, higher with video laryngoscopy than direct laryngoscopy. 50% increased odds. Well, there was no difference in ROSC, though. Hmm. Now, ultimately, I would argue we don't care about ROSC. We care about functional neurologic survival. That version of the ESO data set didn't have that data, so we had to use what we had. So this is disappointing to me. Now, there was a Japanese emergency department registry, and the interesting thing about this is they were the people doing the intubating were very experienced with direct laryngoscopy. And what you'll find is if you go from DL to a hyperacute angled VL, boy, you're not very successful at it because the technique is different. Um, even with that, they found higher first pass success with VL, better view, anybody who's used VL knows you get a better view, um, and less esophageal intubations. Okay, well, that's good. Um, does it improve success? Yes, it does. VL had a higher first pass success, 94% versus 87%. All right, what about after the advanced airway is already in place? Is it maybe that we are bagging patients faster with intubation than we are with supraglottics? And as much as I talked to Dr. Wang about this, he is convinced this is the issue. Um, and he certainly could be right. Well, if that's the case, does it matter? Well, this was a study, two-part study, 
Um, and what it did, the first part went out and looked at cardiac arrest, directly observed, and noted what the average respiratory rate was. So how fast are we bagging? And remember, we're supposed to be bagging around 10. What were we doing? Around 30. Anybody who's looked at this can tell that we hyperventilate patients constantly. Why? Because we're human. If you want to eliminate that, get a machine to do the ventilation. Then they said, well, if you're going to hyperventilate, what is the impact on things we care about? Um, so there was a pig lab, and this was great. I just love these pig studies. Um, with the caveat that most people are not pigs, most. So there is some limits to it, but I think physiologically, this is a pretty sound explanation for this. They took these pigs, they measured interthoracic pressure and coronary perfusion pressure, and then they altered the number of respirations they gave. The faster you ventilated, the um, higher your interthoracic pressure. This is bad because the higher your interthoracic pressure, the lower your coronary uh, perfusion pressure is. This is bad, does that make sense? All right, what about this ITD? Um, you know, I'm sorry, I actually don't have another, I was thinking about this first pass success. I wanna get away from my slides a little bit and tell you about another study that was done in Seattle. And they took all of their cardiac arrest and they broke them up into the number of attempts it took to get the patient intubated. This is the way I wanted to do part. Um, this is the way I wanted to look at the impact of first pass success. Now, overall, their first pass success, all cardiac arrest was 66%. And this also was almost exclusively DL. Survival, if you only had one attempt, overall, asystole, VFib, everybody, was 11% with first pass success. I'm sorry, overall survival, regardless of the number, was around 10. First pass success, 11%. Second attempt, if you fail the first time and get it on the second, survival was 4% and it kept dropping with each incremental attempt. More attempts associated with worse outcomes. First pass success absolutely mattered if your overall first pass success isn't that high. I repeated that in my system where our overall first pass success rate in cardiac arrest is 90%. There was no difference in survival between first and second attempt. So I think what that tells us is that first pass success does matter. That's, that's my belief on this. Um, I guess the, the other way I would answer that question is we took DL off of our trucks. We only use VL, um, and it definitely increased our first pass success. So I, I think it probably would. Um, all right, what about the ITD? This is a picture of the ITD. The, the brand name is up there. Um, this was part of Rock Primed. What they did was um, used ITD versus a sham ITD, and what they found was no difference. All right, what about the ITD plus the toilet plunger? So this is an ACD, so it's an active compression decompression device. It's the suction canister that you put on. And when you come back, so let's compare this to say a Lucas device. Lucas looks like a suction cup, but it's actually not. It can be, it's just not here in the US. When that plunger comes up, it is designed just to go back to neutral. It's not designed to go past neutral. This is designed for you to pull past a neutral and create negative interthoracic pressure. There was a study done on just the ACD device, no difference in survival. This study, called the Rescue Trial, compared survival with the plunger thingy and an ITD, all right? Combined, there was improved survival. So the ITD by itself doesn't work. ACD by itself doesn't work. Combined it does work, 58% improved neurologic survival. All right, so let me just sum up here. What are the things that, what is our takeaway on airway management? First off, focus less on airway management. This isn't what's gonna make the difference in cardiac arrest. Uh, minimally interrupted chest compressions and defibrillation, that's the way to go. Passive oxygenation works, just use it in the right patient. Mask ventilation works, it just works early on. Don't interrupt compressions, don't delay defibrillation, don't delay epinephrine. And if you're gonna intubate, do it right. If you can't do it right, use a supraglottic device. And what I mean by doing it right is don't interrupt compressions and get it in on the first attempt. If your system's first pass success rate is not very good, probably should just move to a supraglottic device. Um, I think that's the bottom line. 
If you are going to intubate, my personal opinion is that you should use video laryngoscopy and you should know how to use that video laryngoscopy. Once you get the tube in, for the love of God, don't hyperventilate. And if you're going to use an ITD, make sure you're using the little pumpy thing with it. Now, the last thing that I want to tell you is NAMSP, the National Association of EMS Physicians, just came out with this huge airway compendium. It is a compendium of 14 different position statements with resource um, papers. All of these are freely available. You can go to the PEC Pre-Hospital Emergency Care website and download each and every one of, you, of these things. Fascinating reading. The whole damn thing, it was one of these. Um, this paper, however, was on pre-hospital cardiac airway arrest management. What cardiac airway? Cardiac arrest airway management. I knew something about that didn't sound right. And the bottom line for them is pretty much what we just talked about. Do what you're good at and don't let it interfere with the things that make a difference. I think that's about as reasonable summation of what we know about airway management as we're going to get. Um, if you all ever have any questions, that's my email address, jjarvis at wilcote.org, and that's my Twitter handle. Thank you all very much. I really appreciate it. You all have a wonderful day.